any time you have pure religion, you have raise up beside pure religion, false religion. And what raises up with false religion, and we've been dealing with this, some might say ad nauseum in our little study in Jude, but we have been dealing with this, what is apostasy, what is false teaching. Elijah sent me, uh, I think, was it this morning you sent me? He sent me this thing. I toyed with the idea of playing it, but I was afraid that uh, if I played it from up at the pulpit that lightning might strike me. Um, it was the, the sparkle, what did they call it? The, sp the sparkle creed. And in this creed that this woman is leading the people in, it talks about how Jesus is born of two fathers. And the whole thing presents itself as, you know, the LGBTQ, you know, the alphabet soup people. Um, and, and the whole concept that is being given there is that Jesus welcomes and affirms this, and not only welcomes and affirms this, but also is a byproduct of it. And, you know, it, it's heretical. It's not even something that you could laugh at or chuckle at. It's just something that when you watch it, all, I, I, my response to Elijah was, welcome to New Sodom. And this is, this is what we're living in. False religion raises itself up alongside true religion. But sometimes false religion is more subtle. For instance, you might have heard in the past that it is wrong for a black person and a white person to marry. And I, I frankly don't care how you feel about that. It's not wrong. We are one race in Christ Jesus. It would be wrong for an unsaved person and a saved person to get married. That would be wrong. But we cannot drag any, what we, what we so commonly term today, I think it's a misnomer, we, we talk about racial tensions or racial ideologies. I have a problem with the word racial because it implies multiple races. And there are not multiple races, there is one race. There are multiple ethnicities. And we've been dealing with multiple ethnicities ever since Babel. Since Babel, ethnic changes began to happen where people had their own language groups and they were separated out from each other. And in that separation, grew different ideologies that, that, that we still even see today. Uh, there's, what does uh, Solomon tell us? That there's no new thing under the sun. So all of the old sins are just being repackaged today. You see things, you know, you, you look at Greek philosophy, and you can read Greek philosophy, and you can say to yourself, you know, all the way back here, they're saying the exact same things that they're saying today. It's the same concept. It's the same ideas. Why? Because mankind is uniquely uncreative. <laughs> and we, we can be thankful in a sense that they have a, a limitation that God has put on them. In the sense that, let me put it to you this way, I believe in the total depravity of man, but I do not believe in the utter depravity of man. If mankind were utterly depraved, it would be impossible for us to live in this world. But yet, because of the total depravity of man, God still allows enough of a semblance in humanity that there is government. Government is supposed to work effectively for, uh, as a representative of God. But yet, we see that that oftentimes fails because government becomes bloated. Government begins to look at itself rather than those that it's supposed to be protecting. But I say all of this because... What happens here in Acts chapter 10 is an undoing of Babel. It is bringing back together all of those people that were cast afar off for so many years. We can trace the line. We see Adam. What did we talk about on Sunday? We talked about Cain and Abel, right? What do we see in Cain? We see the, the epitome of unholiness and the rejection, the, the wholesale rejection 
of God and anything that his religion imposes upon man. With Abel, we see the opposite. We see, we see faithful Abel, who, who walked in righteousness, and he being dead, yet speaketh. So we see in Abel, we see a line that begins. Then we have Seth, then we move down from Seth. We see that God you, chooses Noah. Why? Not because he was righteous, but because God chose him out of grace. Then we go from Noah, we go to Shem, and from Shem we go down to Abraham. And why in the world would the Lord pick Abraham? An older gentleman, seemingly unable to bear children with his wife, who is worshiping the moon goddess in Ur. And the Lord chooses him out of that. And then we see through as, as the Lord continues, but that there is a narrowing. We call that a funnel point. And it narrows all the way down to Messiah. But then once it hits Messiah, on the other side, it begins to go the opposite direction. So we have a narrowing down to Messiah, and then on the other side, we have this, this funneling out. And what's, what's happening in that instance? The Lord begins to bring people back in. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. The gospel is going to go to Jerusalem, and it does quite effectively. But yet, there are ideologies that are embraced by the, the Jewish church that frustrates, so to speak, the, sh the shedding or, or spreading of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because there are holdovers to this late Second Temple Judaism that is a false religion that grew up alongside of true religion. Anybody who was a genuine practitioner of biblical Judaism would have welcomed Messiah. But yet we see this general rejection of Messiah by all those who claim to be the religious elite. Why? Because they had added so much to the religion. For some reason, mankind prefers a religion where they're the ones that are in the driver's seat. We see this even in Christianity, in the spurious ideas that have grown up in Christianity that want to put mankind in the driver's seat, that have God in heaven biting his nails and wondering, is anybody going to come to me? Is anybody going to choose me? And so we have all of this that grows up because there is this inherent sense of man, inside of mankind that we can still do what Adam and Eve couldn't do. What did Adam and Eve want to do? Be like God. And we still have that, I, I, I called it this on Sunday, fig leaf theology. We still have that fig leaf theology. And what is fig leaf theology? It's the belief that somehow we can, on our own, cover up our own nakedness. All we have to do is sew a couple of fig leaves together. And we see this, this present in all ages of history. Even in the very beginning, we presume from the way the scriptures read, we presume that the fall was not years after creation, but it was relatively in short order after creation. And sin is injected into the cosmos. The entire cosmos begins to experience death and decay because of the actions of God's representatives on earth. Isn't that interesting? So, as, as we proceed through all of the, the, the history, we move through Genesis, we see Babel, we see the dividing up of humanity. Mankind is now at odds with each other. From that grows what? <laughs> Wars, fighting, ethnic superiority. I would wager that in this room, there's just a general feeling that because we're Americans, we're better than the rest of the world. It just happens. It's part and parcel to being American. 
quite frequently we have this, this concept that has been taught to us of American exceptionalism. And we, we, we swallow this hook, line, and sinker that somehow we're better than the rest of the world. But yet Christ is teaching us humility. He's teaching us understanding. And this is not just unique to America. Have you ever met a British person? They think they're better than everybody. It's just part of being British. You talk to them, rule Britannia, Britannia rules the waves. They have this mentality. And so Alistair Begg had this conversation. He's from Scotland, which is British, UK. And he has this conversation with a, a Chinese woman at an airport, and he says to her, however in the world did you come to know Jesus Christ as your savior? Why? Because we have this exceptional attitude. When I talked with Quoquo, I said to him, however did you come to know Jesus Christ as your savior? You know what his response was? My mom and dad were Christians. Do you know how foreign that is to me? To think to myself that he's a second generation Christian in China? Because I just presume and assume that everybody over there is lost and dying and going to hell. And I can't imagine in my mind that there is a functioning church in such a dysfunctional society. And yet there is. And it is a church that is growing exceptionally faster than the church in America is growing. And yet we still have these notions that we've got to go over there and help them. I think the time is almost here where they need to come help us. We're leading the charge on many of these things. And the descent and spiral downwards in society is being heralded here in America when we have a whole month. When, when one of our top people identifies himself as a herself wearing the uniform of the armed services and declaring that it's not just Pride Month, but it's the summer of pride. And we think to ourselves, this is acceptable? And it's not just, you know, lest we be foolish and think that somehow homosexuality is the cardinal sin. It's not just that. The church, why are we here? Because the church has been patty caking with sin for a long time. And we've been allowing it to, to grow and to fester. And so now it's becoming more bold and more brash. But yet, despite the fact that all of history is covered in all of this, this, this mess and this mire, the history of humanity is a very dark and gruesome thing. Have you ever read about the Crusades? They're crazy. All in the name of Jesus. History is filled with darkness because humanity is filled with sin. But yet into that darkness is interjected Jesus Christ, the light of the world. And at his death, the middle wall of partition is torn down. And that, that you might say that, or you might hear me say that, and you might think, oh, oh the preacher just loves to say these words. <laughs> but yet when I say it, I'm up here with goose pimples on me because of the fact that the temple veil was rent in twain I now have access into the very holiest place. We can have a prayer meeting here on Wednesday night and know that we have access to the very throne room of heaven because Jesus Christ walked in to the holiest place in heaven with his own blood and he put it on the horns of the altar. And he said, I stand as the Messiah redeemer of my people Amen. and he has set us apart so the Jews were set apart and you realize that when we say Jew 
Why do we say Jew? Sometimes we, we say Jew, and, and I don't think we understand what we're saying. We say Jew, we're thinking to ourselves of the tribe of Judah, which was the southern kingdom, which existed beyond Israel, the northern kingdom. But we're really thinking to ourselves of just the entire Hebraic system. We're thinking of, of all 12 tribes. We're thinking to ourselves that, that these people have this attitude that is, if you're not of Jacob, then you're not anything. Now, God's people were intended to be set apart, right? That's the attitude that the Lord has for his people, that we in this church are to be set apart from the world. We're supposed to be, John, that one person raising our hand, saying, I'm different than everybody else around me. Because we are set apart. We're not going to buy into the lie that we need to act like the world so that the world will receive us. That's separation. Late Second Temple Judaism had created a type of separation that is not separation, it's isolation. And so Peter's going to make a statement in Acts that is erroneous. Is it okay for Peter to be erroneous? Yes. Yes, it is. Why? Because guess what? He ain't the Pope. <laughs> so let's read it. Verse 21 of chapter 10. It says, Then Peter went down to the men. Remember, we've had the rooftop sheet vision. Peter goes down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius and says, Behold, I am he whom ye seek. What is the cause wherefore ye are come? Now, why does he do this? Why does he go down to them? How does he know? Does anybody up, go up and get them? No, verses 19 and 20 told, tell us that the Holy Spirit says, um, says to him, Behold, there's three men who come, have come looking for you. Go down with them and don't doubt because I've sent them to you. So he goes down and he says, Hey, I, I'm the one you're looking for. And they said uh, in verse 22, verse 22, Cornelius the centurion a just man and one that feareth God and of good report among all the nation of the Jews was warned from God by an holy angel to send for thee into his house and to hear words of thee. Then called he them in and lodged them, and on the morrow apparently it's too late for them to go. So they come in and they give a good report of Cornelius in verse 22. And then they say the reason why they're there. An angel has sent for you. And Peter says, well, come in and stay with me. Now, this is interesting because where is he staying? He's staying in Joppa at Simon the Tanner's house. Why is that important? We said last Wednesday night, because what does a tanner do? He deals with dead animals. What is a Jew not supposed to touch? A dead animal. Why? Because it's unclean. Why is Peter staying with an unclean man? Because Peter is starting to get an awakening that the false Judaism that he had been following for so long that was so concerned about external things was not right. So let's pause here for a moment and recognize that what we do externally is vitally important to our testimony. But it does not always reflect what is going on internally. Did you hear that? Jesus comes and his message is, there's got to be a change that happens internally, and that's the only way that you can see real external change. The Judaistic message was, have external change. Look different on the outside, but it doesn't matter what's going on in the inside. They never dealt with the inside. That's why when Jesus comes, he calls them a whitewashed sepulcher. What's a sepulcher? A tomb. He calls them a whitewashed tomb. What does that mean? Well, you know, you go out and you paint your tomb and you make it look nice, but there's nothing on the inside. It's dead. It's gone. It's done. It's over with, right? That's what he's dealing with. He's saying this is the problem. You're dead on the inside, but you're trying to dress it up on the outside. It's interesting to me how many Christians take this mentality when they think to themselves, you know, if somebody's going to come into this church, boy, they better clean themselves up. They better put a suit on. They better not be smoking any of those coffin nails outside of the, the church on Sunday morning. 
They better be making sure that they're acting just the right way and that their language is just perfect when they come in and, excuse me, when butt hits pew. <laughs> but this is the reality. Unless there is an internal change that happens, it doesn't matter how dressed up they are on the outside. So we have the evidence of of salvation is changes happen externally, but they are merely a mirror reflection of internal change. Now, what happens when you keep trying to, to keep up a facade? Have you ever tried to keep a lie going? It's difficult, isn't it? And, and eventually you forget how many lies you have to tell along the way just to keep the original lie and so we recognize that it is extremely difficult for someone to keep the, the, the outside clean if the inside's filthy. Peter's having to learn this because his whole religion, even though he's a Jew, even though he has had the oracles of God, the rabbis have been teaching what? They've been teaching clean it up on the outside. And they've never been saying, clean it up on the inside. That's why when John the Baptist comes, he says, you need to repent. Why? Not because you're externally yucky, but because you're internally filthy. And there needs to be a repentance that happens. So, this is what Peter's learning. He tells them, come in, spend the night, we'll get going tomorrow. They get going. Verse 24, after they entered into Caesarea and Cornelius waited for them. But he's excited. He has called together his kinsmen and his near friends. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. Now, if Peter, just, just an aside here, if Peter was the Pope with the fisherman's ring on his hand, he'd have said, go ahead, kiss the ring and greet me with the proper homage. But that's not what Peter says, right? What does Peter say? Yeah, listen, I'm just like you. Verse 26, I myself also am a man, so stand up. <laughs> this is the attitude that we have to have. Verse 27, and he talked with him, and then he went in. <laughs> Can you imagine Peter's response when he goes in, and he's like, what are all these people doing here? Cornelius has called them together for one purpose. Why? To listen to what Peter has to say. So, Peter calls them in, or uh, Cornelius calls them in. Peter goes in. He sees all of these people together. And what does he do? Verse 28, he says unto them, Ye know, now here's where Peter's wrong. Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. Nowhere in the law does it teach this. It teaches separation, but it does not teach isolation. The rabbis at some point down the road had added this in such a way that they said that if you went in to a Gentile's house, you were seven days unclean because of that. But the Bible doesn't teach that anywhere. The only reason why you were seven days unclean was if you touched a dead body. Now, there have been some assumptions to this. Abortion is not a new thing. And they were aborting children in Gentile homes. The Jews would not. And if, a, if an unborn child died in a Jewish home, it got a burial. And so there is some discussion as to whether or not if, if an aborted child was killed in a Gentile home, they just, in, a, in essence, flushed the child. And so the house would be considered unclean then. And so that's some reasons why they have put forth as to why they, they uh, couldn't go into a Gentile's home because of this uh, laissez-faire attitude towards the death of their unborn children. Whether that's true or not, there's a lot more study that needs to be done. It could be just that the Jews were very, very much all about preserving their identity. 
God had told them to be separate, but how were they supposed to be separate? You see, you've got to harmonize this in your mind because we're talking about on Sunday nights, we're talking about who? Ruth. And she's from where? Moab. Not Israel, but Moab. So how does Ruth get a pass? How is it that people aren't perpetually unclean? How is it that Boaz goes to her and is, is not unclean? How does she get this somehow to come into this? So you see, this is what happens. Can, can I put it into, uh, into modern day terms? We get so caught up over certain things today, such as uh, I remember back when... Uh, uh, Ellen was the spokesperson for Kmart. Anybody remember Kmart? You know, that you fondly remember the blue light specials at Kmart. <laughs> but I remember when Ellen was made the spokesperson for Kmart, and there were all these Christians that said, I ain't never going to shop at Kmart because Ellen is the spokesperson there. Well, this becomes a problem. Now you've got to get a resume on every single person that you deal with. When you walk into a restaurant, you've got to get a resume from the waiter or the waitress and find out if they're homosexual or not. Because if they are, then, you know, oh, unclean, unclean, and you've got to walk away from them. So you see, what happens is ridiculousness ensues where legalism abounds. It's about an internal thing. Don't worry about them. Worry about what's going on internally and then share the gospel with everybody you come in contact with. Be separate from them in practice. You know, you're, you're saying to yourself, well, I'm not going to work with these people who are giving the, the sparkle creed out. I'm not going to have an evangelistic crusade with them. Why? Because they're teaching heresy. So we separate from that. But yet we don't separate ourselves so much. This is, in my mind, I've always felt that this is part of the condemnation of the entire Israeli nation, is that they were to be representatives of true religion to the world, and they became reduced to navel-gazing. They just looked in at themselves. And that's something that we've got to worry about as a church. We've got to ensure that we are not doing that. So then, finally, what happens? Verse uh, 29, therefore, or no, he says in verse 28, but God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. That's part of the whole sheet thing, right? The whole sheet thing that's going on. Why couldn't Peter have just gotten up and killed a clean animal? Because on the sheet that descends, there's both clean and unclean animals. Why couldn't he just get up and kill a clean animal and eat? Because Peter was so hyper-Jewish that he's thinking to himself, just because these animals have been on the same sheet, I can't even have one. But that's not what's being taught either in the law. And so that's, that's the, the, the fear that can happen. That's what happens when people half listen to the sermon and then they go on and what do they do? They, they tend to, to jump to the wrong conclusion. So verse 30, uh, Cornelius says, well, Peter says in verse 29, why did you call me here? And verse 30 and to 33, we'll read this and conclude. And Cornelius said, four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thine arm, alms are had in remembrance of the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon a tanner by the seaside, who when he cometh shall speak unto thee. Immediately therefore I sent thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now, therefore, are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded of thee? I can't help but get excited at this because this very last line, can you imagine? You're a preacher. You get invited to a house of people who don't know Jesus, and they tell you, we all came here to listen to you tell us about Jesus. Could you imagine that? Next week, we're going to see what happens. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for what we've seen this evening as we've been studying this, we pray, Lord, that we would be thankful for the mess that we see that Jesus is sorting out and how he continues to sort this out as the church grows 
We thank you, Lord, for the fact that that middle wall of partition was taken down so that we might become one in Christ Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.